Yeah, for my research, yeah. Did you get any Cadbury wine? Sure. Yeah. Are you are you a fan? I've had a couple bottles of it. Yeah. That's great. I know no, I, I, stuff. No, I've been I've been lucky enough to be at a house where they actually, you know, run their small like house winery, so literally from the Cadbury in the in the basement, but oh wow, having it having it from there, so That's incredible. It's great. No, I generally I didn't spend as much time in the wine regions because uh -huh. they're more eastern parts. But, yeah. You're in the eastern parts, huh? Well, the the wine is more in the eastern parts, and I was more on the glossy coast, but they drink wine everywhere. So. <laughs> oh, so you're near where the old uh, tea farms were? Yeah. Yeah. One of my teachers worked at the the, the tea plantation in the six in the like. 60s, uh -huh. from Soviet era. Yeah. It's just amazing. It's like the third biggest producer of tea, and then now there's like nothing. Yeah, I mean they were sort of the. They had a captive market. You know, they mm -hmm. were the main tea producers for the Soviet Union, or one of the main ones. Right. Same with citrus, and other things like that. And then once the markets opened, then there wasn't any point in it. Complete collapse. Yeah. No, it's fine, but you know, it, the, the question of scale versus when you need to try it in China or India, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I tried it out. The volume was a little low, but he said you should turn it up in mine. Okay.
co-chair of the History of Music Theory Study Group, the AMS, and one of the co-organizers of this event. Uh, on behalf of myself and the other organizers, my co-chairs, Stefano Mangozzi, Emily Zazulia, and our colleagues in the SMT History of Theory Interest Group, Abby Shoup, Scott Gleason, and Stephanie Hobst, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, both those of you who are in person after such a long time not seeing one another, um, and to those tuning in remotely. We're so glad that you can be here with us. I also want to thank the institutions that have provided funding to make this conference possible. These include the University of Michigan, the University of Music and Performing Arts in Vienna, the University of California, Berkeley, Stony Brook University Department of Music, the American Musicological Society, and the Society for Music Theory. Uh, last but certainly not least, I want to extend a special thanks to our liaison at Loyola University, Alice Clark, and Loyola University itself for hosting this event. I promise uh, my remarks here will be brief. I know we're at the starting line of what will be an exhilarating but also exhausting week of fascinating presentations, intense discussions, and professional and personal reconnections. Uh, I certainly don't want to try anyone's patience right out of the gate. But if I may, this conference, Identity in Music Theory and History, aims to do something new. Uh, and that necessarily involves some risk. So I'd like to take a few minutes to describe how this conference came about, what I think some of the risks may be, why we, the organizers, thought they were worth taking. It's fair to say that identity has become a pressing concern in the field of music theory. It's not a new concern, as those who have worked to increase representation within the field for many years well know. I'm thinking of the Committees on the Status of Whitman in SMT and the Committee on Race and Ethnicity. But issues related to identity gained a significant boost in 2019 SMT keynote addresses from Philip Ewell, Elias Sama, Ayo Uno Everett, and Joseph Strauss. These talks placed identity front and center in a way that felt and continues to feel new for a number of reasons. In part, it's because they had center stage for the issue, perhaps for the first time. In part, because they all made identity part of one broader conversation. And in part, because questions of identity resonate in our historical moment with broader conversations about race, gender, disability, and so on that have received much more public attention over the past several years. The concept of identity is complex, but discussions of it tend to share a concern with ethics. And this ethical call for inclusion is something to which many scholars have responded. There's now a widely shared, perhaps not universal, but prevalent sense that greater diversity is a worthy goal. Specifically, there's something like consensus, I think, on three things. First, music theory should welcome people with a broad range of identities to participate in the field. Second, the materials used to represent and to teach music theory should represent a fuller range of identities, women, people of color, disabled musicians and scholars, and so on. And third, music theory should address music beyond the central core of European-derived classical styles on which the discipline was largely founded and which, in many ways, continue to constitute its intellectual center. But identity raises a thornier problem, one that the 2019 SMT speakers addressed, but which I think has gotten less airtime over the past few years. And that's the relationship between a theorist's identity and the work they produce. That is to say, or to ask, is there a causal relationship between who one is or imagines oneself to be and the way in which they theorize music? And if there is, what are the ramifications of this for the field? It's here that a connection between identity and theory can seem perhaps most disconcerting. A kind of crude determinism lurks. A person who identifies as X will produce theory Y. Fragmentation follows. The field loses any coherent center, dissolving into a loose collection of mutually incomprehensible epistemologies that yield perhaps to historiographic or ethnographic methodologies, but not to theory. On this view, 
identity or identity politics, as some might dismissively put it, is a threat to the discipline, that is, the shared sense of intellectual and practical norms around which a scholarly community organizes itself. But of course, this is the point. Focusing on identity entails a conscious effort to undermine any unified hegemonic discipline, precisely because discipline involves normalization. Normalization favors whoever does the normalizing. Now, on the one hand, this slippery slope argument ought not to deter us from asking critical questions. We can't simply bury our heads in the sand. On the other, I wonder if such anxiety may be overblown. As Thomas Christensen noted in his introduction to the Cambridge history of Western music following Dahlhaus, it's long been difficult to define music theory in a way that does justice to the diversity of thought that we put under its umbrella, even when that thought is narrowly Eurocentric. So the ethics of Plato's Republic, classical canonics, rhythmic modes, speculative theory in the music of the spheres, practical and theoretical attempts to corral mode, musica poetica, the practical traditions of Parlamenti and figured bass, empirical theory ranging from Vincenzo Galilei to current research in cognitive psychology and embodiment, and on and on. In what sense are these all music theory? So I want to say, if scrutinizing the question of identity's role in theorizing music threatens to undermine disciplinary norms and transform what we think music theory is, so be it. Perhaps it's only our chains that we have to lose. But this conference was organized around a more positive vision, not to tear down what has been, but to build something new. Its fundamental question is simply this. What do historians of music theory have to contribute to questions of identity? And here, I think we can write new histories that may become part of what music theory is. We can include new figures and ideas in the purview of theory, as Kristen Francine is doing with Rosa Newmarch in her paper, Patrick Domico and Lucy Liu's presentation on Metner does this, and I think Peter Martin's paper on Isaac Fossius as well. If this approach deepens our understanding of what theory can be, our understanding can also be broadened by expanding the geopolitical boundaries that have too narrowly circumscribed it in the past. And so we'll hear work from Brian Fairley, Julia Agronero, and Ashanta Peris that point us towards the Caucasus, Sri Lanka, and the greater Mediterranean. We can also write new histories of that which we thought we knew, ideas that have manifestly been part of our canon, enshrined in literature as the inauguration or culmination of this or that theory. And here I'm looking forward to Andrew Chung's paper on tuning and temperament. And then, rather than assuming the fixity of theoretical concepts that transcend the ideas of their thinkers, the identity of their thinkers, we may ask how identity was crucial to the formation of those very concepts. And I think we may hear something along these lines in Frank Heidelberger's talk on Reichen. So what if the history of music theory is as much the stories of the people who make theory as it is a catalog and delineation of their ideas? Shifting metaphors, might we loosen the soil and prepare for the growth of new paradigms? Paradigms that embrace the contingency, contestability, and sociability of music theory. Obviously, I'm not going to answer these questions, but we'll have the opportunity to discuss these ideas and more after the papers in each session and with these ideas fresh in our minds during the roundtable discussion tomorrow morning. For now, let me just say once again that I'm excited to see this conference come to fruition and to welcome you all to Identity in Music Theory and History. Thanks. Thank you, August, for your introductory remarks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Stefano Mengozzi, University of Michigan. Uh, welcome all here. Just a few um, logistical information. This uh, meeting is being uh, live streamed on YouTube. For those of you in the, um, in the audience, uh, your um, when you, when you speak, your, your comments or questions will be picked up by the microphones in the room, so there is no need to move from where you are. For everyone on stage, so I'm speaking primarily to the, or only I guess, to the presenters, uh, you will have to be on the microphone, either these ones or uh, those on the table, um, so that uh, your voice will be 
picked up uh, 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 and, and live streamed. Um, for those of you who are listening uh, remotely, uh, you have a chance to uh, ask questions or comment. Uh, please identify yourself first and then uh, use the, the chat function uh, uh, for your comments or questions and then uh, the session chair will uh, read it and, um, and uh, um, transmit it and, 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 and uh, relay it to the, um, to the um, participants for, for the answer. Uh, there is a dinner tonight at Grand Isle restaurant, uh, which is very close to the conference hotel, the, the major conference hotel. Uh, uh, the dinner is at 7.15. We are in a position to subsidize dinner, um, but we need to know how many of you are coming. So uh, we'll, we'll have a head count. Uh, at the intermission at 4 o'clock for uh, confirmation and then um, um, we'll relay the information to the restaurant. Um, so if you are considering coming, uh, please uh, let us know uh, again uh, before the evening. Uh, finally, on the, finally, there are bathrooms on the, uh, just outside the door, you may have seen them walking in outside the door on the right and then in the hallway on the left. And now I'd like to move on to the first speaker, who is um, actually. Why don't you come and sit up? Oh, you already ready? Yeah, it's all set up. Oh, it's all set up. Okay. So the first speaker is uh, Brian Fairley, who is a PhD candidate at New York University. Uh, uh, he's doing a, he's writing a dissertation entitled "Dissecting," sorry, "Dissected Listening: A Media History of Georgian Polyphonic Recording." His work has been published in Ethnomusicology and Ethnomusicology Review, with forth forthcoming work in the Journal of Sonic Studies and a volume on anti-racist music theory. Uh, the title of uh, Brian's talk is uh, Form as Ethno-National Icon, Excavating Polyphony in the Caucasus. Let us welcome Brian Fair. Much. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Hopefully this will show up in a moment. There we go. <clears throat> Here is a theory of the nation formulated by the most significant Georgian head of state in history. A nation is a historically constituted, stable community of people formed on the basis of common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in the common culture. Any, any guesses as to the author? Yeah. <laughs> yes, if, if it sounds familiar, it's for good reason. This is from Marxism and the National Question, a revised version of a 1913 article by Yosef Jugashvili, one of the first he signed under the sobriquet of Stalin. As definitions go, <clears throat> that one strikes me as a use useful enough heuristic, one I've employed to organize my remarks today. <clears throat> the problems, of course, really begin when a theory moves out of its original context of debate and polemic and becomes something like dogma. Thus, Stalin's article became a guiding framework, a sacred text even, when the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 30s set about defining the nationalities of its citizens. Far from an abstract ethnological exercise, deciding which groups met the criteria of nationhood and which belonged to various subcategories was quite literally a matter of life and death, especially when entire ethnicities would be branded as politically suspect and thousands of people deported to internal exile. The discourse around national identity in the Soviet Union and its successor states is both complicated and prone to oversimplification, though the ramifications of nationality policy are still acutely felt today, we need look no further than Ukraine and the rhetoric surrounding the linguistically or ethnically Russian regions claimed by Putin. In this talk, I'll be focusing on one successor state, Georgia and the South Caucasus, and the way national identity has become wedded to a particular concept for music theory, polyphony. Once again, we will see a theory breaking its disciplinary bounds and playing an active, concrete role in people's lives for good or ill. 
co-opting the structure of Stalin's thesis, I'll first offer historical snapshots of Georgian polyphony's encounters with academic music theory before turning to the four theoretical conditions of nationhood, language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup. In present-day Georgia, the idea of polyphony has found its way into each of these areas, often reinforcing ethnically exclusionary claims on Georgianness. In its most cynical form, polyphony as national ideology promises the peaceful coexistence of multiple voices, even as it silences those who don't fit a vision of Georgia's historical destiny. So when we talk about Georgian polyphony, typically, in case you're not familiar, we're talking about a uh, 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 folk and sacred music tradition that is typically three voices uh, unaccompanied though occasionally with some instruments, though that's not the only kind of folk music in Georgia. And uh, the history of, of the story uh, intersects with a lot of um, sort of Western style uh, institutions, so, so I'll get into here. So Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, has had a music conservatory since 1917. And there was an active European musical scene for decades before, with such landmarks as the opening of an opera house in 1851 and the establishment of a choir singing arrangements of Georgian folk song in 1886. The first people to write analytically about Georgian folk and sacred music were composers like Zakaria Pagliashvili and Dimitri Arapichvili, who also incorporated folk songs into their operas. For a brief period in the early 20th century, however, Georgian singing attracted the attention of prominent academics outside Georgia or Russia. One was Robert Lach, a comparative musicologist who later assumed the distinguished chair of musicology, Musikwissenschaft, at the University of Vienna. Hans Lick, author, Lach. Um, Lach made recordings of Georgian prisoners of war in Austria-Hungary during the First World War. He was especially struck by songs from Western Georgia, which to his ears sounded like medieval or Renaissance polyphony. These specimens featured prominently in many of his writings, notably in his chapter for Guido Adler's Handbook of Music History, which likely brought them to wider notice. We have a letter from Adler himself, you know, one of the founders of musicology, to the Vienna Phonogram Archive, in which he inquires specifically about recordings of Georgian polyphony. Other studies follow, Siegfried Nadel's Georgian Songs in 1933, and several works by Mario Schneider, including parts of his ambitious History of Polyphony. Both of these men worked with other recordings of Georgian song held in the Berlin Phonogram Archive. Georgian musicologists continue to honor these German and Austrian figures today as they offer a certain authoritative val validation from the European mainstream. Uniting all these works was an interest in Georgian polyphony as a token of evolutionary or cultural history. Robert Lach believed that all cultures would evolve through the same musical forms, with European harmonic practice as the self-evident apogee of progress. Polyphony was thus an argument for a certain level of intellect and civilization on the part of the Georgians, a distinction many Georgians were happy to claim, especially in distinction to neighbors who didn't seem to practice polyphony. Nadal and Schneider, in different ways, employed cultural diffusionist approaches, taking on the question of how Georgian polyphony might have emerged historically. Most audaciously of all, they floated the idea that medieval European polyphony may in fact have come from the Caucasus and not the other way around, as most had presumed. Ultimately, the question of origin permeates both the evolutionary and diffusionist frameworks. And this, I think, is significant for thinking about the history of music theory. By the end of the 19th century, European music theory had self-consciously fashioned its own origin in the 9th century treatises describing the apparently new practice of polyphony. Theorists saw in these systems of consonant and dissonant intervals the embryonic shape of all that was to come. Georgian polyphony, apparently isolated from the course of Western music history, troubled this neat narrative, but only somewhat. For what if this affinity between Georgian and European polyphony, in the absence of a documented history of interaction and influence, bespoke a deeper, even genetic relationship? And here, race and nation, two other fields of 19th century thought obsessed with the question of origins, come into play. As Alexander Redding points out, theorists like Hugo Riemann were invested in the, in the question of which nation had invented different kinds of polyphonic practice, taking pains to cite historical evidence from Germanic or Teutonic regions, for instance, even England counted as Germanic for his purposes. Um, it's only a few short steps, I think, from this to the position that certain races are predisposed to polyphony, something I've recently written about elsewhere and would be happy to discuss more in the Q&A. 
<clears throat> in brief, polyphony became loosely associated with a hypothetical old Europe, as in Adam Lomax's song style regions. Although, uh, although scholarship making explicit links between polyphony and racial or national identity largely fell out of favor in the post-World War II era, such ideas are remarkably durable. As we shall see, they fit easily with the idea of the Georgian nation as an island of ancient European culture in the midst of nations coded as Eastern, Muslim, or otherwise unfree. Uh, just as an aside, there's another branch of music theoretical thinking in which Georgian music played a part, which I don't have time to develop here, but namely the, the, the so-called Leningrad polyphonic school. And for anyone interested, there a, a, was a good interview published uh, by Philip Ewell with the late Tatiana Bershatskaya discussing this tradition. The important figure here is uh, Christopher Kushnarov, who never published about Georgian music, but whose lectures and writings on polyphony influenced a generation of theorists and composers. As I've discovered in my own research, Kushnaryov was intimately involved in a series of important recordings of Georgian music in the 20s and 30s, and had close relationships with several Georgian folk musicians. To what extent the experience of hearing and studying Georgian music influences theories or those of his students is a direction of research I'm, I'm interested in, in pursuing further. So for the rest of my talk, I'll touch on some of the ways that the discourse of polyphony operates in Georgia today. The first condition of the nation, per Stalin, is a common language. The politics of language in the Caucasus are famously complex. The 10th century Arab geographer Al-Masudi dubbed it Jabal al-Asul, or Mountain of Tongues. Georgian, Kartuli Enna in Jordan, is one of four languages in a family known as Karfelian. The other three are Sfan and Megrelian, both uh, spoken in western regions of present-day Georgia, and Laz, an endangered language spoken mostly in parts of Turkey today. No broadly agreed-upon connections have ever been found between Kartvelian and other language families in the world, though not for lack of trying. The completely unfounded idea that Georgian is somehow connected to that other famous language isolate, Basque, has the status of common sense in Georgia, thanks in part to its promotion by political figures like Zviad Gamsakordia, who was Georgia's first post-Soviet president and a trained philologist. In a 1990 speech titled Georgia's Spiritual Mission, he argues that Georgia, as evidenced by these far-fetched linguistic ideas, had been part of the oldest stratum of European culture since ancient times. The historian Stephen Rapp cites Gamsa Khordia and this speech in particular as a major force in shaping the Georgian national narrative. To achieve this, Gamsa Khordia had to downplay the political fragmentation of Georgia throughout its history, as well as its, as well as its intertwined and often advantageous relationships with Muslim societies, in order to posit a stable, indisputably primeval Georgian state that had knowledge of but was distinct from the non-Christian East. Music and polyphony may not have been explicitly invoked here, but this claim to inherent Europeanness has always pointed to that common musical form, as well as this kind of, you know, idea of of, 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 of excavating a stratum of some older practice. One last uh, anecdote about language. Uh, Georgian grammar is known for something called polypersonal agreement, in which a verb form marks not only the subject of an action, but its direct or indirect objects as well. So for what it's worth, it, it does actually share this feature with Basque. Thus, uh, a single word like Lovtsana means he wrote to us, with the ending indicating a third person singular subject, and the g in the middle indicating a second person plural indirect object. The whole system is more complicated than that. But uh, I remember once when talking about it with my Georgian language teacher that she said, of course our music is polyphonic, how could it be otherwise when our, our language is too? <clears throat> the question of territory is closely linked to both language and music. A unified state occupying the whole of modern day Georgia was only briefly a reality in the high middle ages, the so-called golden age of Georgian culture. A much more common state of affairs was a patchwork of kingdoms and principalities and various states of vassalage to neighboring powers. Nevertheless, once the present-day borders of Georgia were more or less defined in the Soviet era, there was an effort to assert a common cultural heritage for all Georgian-speaking people, a cornerstone of which was polyphonic singing. This can be seen, for instance, in the case of Meshetian music. Songs recorded in Mescheti, this border region of Turkey, predominantly feature a single melodic line, unlike much other Georgian folk music. It's by now a commonplace in Georgian scholarship to assert that these songs were once polyphonic, belonging to a broader Georgian, broader Georgian cultural sphere, but had lost their polyphony under the influence of the supposedly monophonic traditions of its Turkish neighbors. 
Whatever the, the historical reality of these claims, there's a long-standing movement to restore polyphony to these songs, that is, to compose additional vocal lines and fulfill, as it were, the ethnic destiny of these borderland Georgians. Similar trends have been observed in the mountainous regions of northeastern Georgia. Uh, the anthropologist Florian Mufried and the ethnomusicologist Lauren Minoshvili have both described how traditional songs from Tusheti are often sung with added voice parts in order to properly Georgianize them. As a, a side note, the same process of polyphonization, as it were, is also applied to women's repertoires in Georgia, which is a, an important related phenomenon that's just for now beyond the scope of what I'm talking about today. <clears throat> the need to spread Georgian polyphony across the national territory applies even in the absence of a common language. As you may know, there are two separatist regions over which the Georgia state has no control, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, these are recognized as independent territories only by Russia and a handful of its allies. Uh, uh, the titular nationalities of these regions, which were semi-autonomous in the Soviet period, are Abkhazian and Ossetian, which are also the names of two languages unrelated to Georgia. Both re regions do have multi-part singing traditions, primarily of the movable drone variety, which Georgian nationalists have long claimed as evidence of borrowing from Georgian polyphony, and more proof that they are relative latecomer latecomers to the Caucasus and properly part of Georgia. Despite the fact that these regions are de facto independent, a Tbilisi-based singing group, Shatna Bada, was recently named the official state ensemble of Abkhazia, a symbolic yet provocative assertion of cultural hegemony. I, I have somewhat less to say about the uh, uh, economic criterion for nationhood as, applies, as it applies to Georgian polyphony, though that's not to say that economics plays no role here. A case in point, in 2012, the millionaire businessman and former minister, minister of the economy Vano Chakartishvili established the Georgian Chanting Foundation, which is one of the most prominent funding organizations for traditional music in Georgia. The year 2012 also <coughs> marked a change in government, as the previous president, Mikhail Saakashvili, was voted out, and a center-right pro-business, generally pro-Russian party, called Georgian Dream took power, which it holds to this day. In general, traditional music has done pretty well under, the regime, under this regime, which has close ties to the Georgian Orthodox Patriarch, a powerful figure in Georgian society, who was uh, in the, the picture at the beginning of the talk. <clears throat> uh, despite its name, the Georgian Chanting Foundation supports activities beyond liturgical chant, but only those, it seems, that suit the ethno-nationalist position I've been outlining today. Which, so, Georgian language, polyphonic, Christian, typically. So in, the, uh, in this way, it continues to trend going back decades. As the ethnomusicologist Nino Tsitsishvili has argued, international funding from organizations like UNESCO has disproportionately supported music fitting the Georgian polyphony mold, ignoring the music of linguistic, ethnic, and religious minorities in Georgia, many of whom have been established in the region for centuries. So lastly, we come to the most slippery and probably most enduring aspect of Stalin's theory, the idea, hardly original, that the members of a nation must share what he variously terms a national character, psychological makeup, or spiritual complexion. For many Georgians, polyphony is a quintessential feature of national character. As uh, Rusudan Swetsumia, director of the International Center for Traditional Polyphony at the Tbilisi Conservatory asserts, singing in parts, quote, is more than simply a means for music expressive, musical expressiveness. It embodies the specific character of Georgians' perception of the universe. When Anzor Erkumayshvili, the founder of the Rustavian Ensemble and a universally recognized public figure, received a state honor in August 2020, the president of Georgia crystallized this perspective. If not for she said, if not for polyphony, if not for these songs which we discovered, salvaged, and preserved for future generations, if not for this, we would not be what we are. No Georgian can say they are Georgian if they have not heard Mravel Jamia, if they have not heard Negruli Nana or the Gurian Krimanchuli. These are all titles and genres of folk singing. And they have not listened to the sacred chants with which we worship. The Georgian nation is the one that created polyphony and introduced it to the world. We are a nation that always sings in times of trouble or sickness. Now, it may seem simple enough to chalk this up to cultural chauvinism of the kind we're all no doubt familiar with from other contexts. But there's something curious that happens when it's not simply a genre or style that acquires the status as a national icon, but rather a theoretical category like polyphony. The anthropologist, uh, excuse me, the anthropologist Julia Sakaria noted during her fieldwork 
in Georgia in the early 2000s that her interlocutors regularly cited poly polyphonic music as a sign that Georgians were inclusive in spirit, able to harmonize with other people. Thus, in her view, there are two imaginaries in tension here. One, nationalist and exclusionary, in which polyphony is the product of a pure Georgian culture, and one, inclusive, in which polyphony can be made to stand in for hybridity, multiculturalism, democracy. While I agree with her assessment, I would go farther and argue that these two imaginaries are really an inseparable dialectic pair. If the concept of polyphony had not arisen in Western music theory, it would not have such enduring prestige in Georgia, nor would it be able to make such outsized claims on universality as to seem a fitting metaphor for political participation in dialogue. We see the same process writ large, I believe, whenever democracy is claimed as the unique patrimony of Europe, often paired rhetorically with other collective achievements like symphonies. This uh, indeed happened in a speech by President Trump in Warsaw in 2017. Georgian polyphony and its role in national ideology perhaps offers a window through which to understand this phenomenon more broadly. Meanwhile, Georgia's aspirations for membership in the EU, the ultimate recognition of Georgia's spiritual Europeanness, finds expression in some fascinating and musical ways. So, um, I know I'm out of time, but uh, just at the end, I'll leave you with uh, a bit from a performance uh, by Shabnabana, the same group appointed state ensemble for Breakaway Abkhazia. Uh, here they seamlessly blend a West Georgian work song with uh, a piece you'll probably recognize as they uh, perform at the European Parliament in Strasbourg to open the World Forum for Democracy. <laughs> Shanta Pires. Shanta Pires is a, 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 a is managing editor of the uh, journals Analytical Approaches to World Music and Analytical Approaches to Music of South Asia. He has taught in Sri Lanka and Canada in the areas of global dance history, Western music history, jazz theory, and global music cultures. The title of Ashanta's talk is uh, Music Theory and Identity Politics in Post-Independence Sri Lanka. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Yes, you've heard the title of my topic. I'll give you a brief um, context to this. Um, so in the decades preceding Sri Lanka's political independence from the British Empire in 1948, Sri Lankan nationalists sought to build a national identity based on cultural traditions associated with the majority Sinhalese ethnicity. These multiple strands of anti-colonial cultural nationalism included initiatives to create a national dance form through gentrifying a ritual dance tradition, and efforts to cleanse the Sinhala language 
of words of European and Indian origin. In the years following national independence, two upper-class music scholars from the Sinhalese ethnic majority, Vincent Somopala and W.B. Makulurga, theorized Sinhalese folk drumming rhythms in relation to Sinhala poetic meters and in opposition to North Indian Hindustani Tala rhythm cycles. Ideologically, Somopala and Makulurga believed that a sovereign nation should have a national tradition of music, that a national music should have roots in the music of the ethnic majority, and that a musical tradition needed a systematic music theory to be considered, quote-unquote, developed. Benefiting from the majoritarian identity politics of the 1956 general election, which saw a populist Sinhalese ethnonationalist government elected on the promise of a Sinhala-only official language policy, they disseminated their new theory of Sinhalese rhythm by embedding it in the national school curriculum. In this paper, I analyze some of the music theoretical reforms introduced by Somopala and Makulodula, uncover the ideological motivations that drove them, and examine the changes in performance practice that resulted from them. I draw connections with identity politics advisedly. After all, the most well-known Anglophone scholarship about Sri Lankan music is Jim Sykes' monograph, The Musical Gift, in which the author argues that the identity episteme in music studies is a trap that, quote, takes a hold of us and determines for us our perspectives on sound and music, even when we recognize that it fails to respect many engagements with sound throughout the world. Um, so, given this caveat, I continue. <laughs> um, ritual music associated with the central, mountainous, central mountains of Sri Lanka often features singing and drumming along with timekeeping patterns played on small cymbals. Prior to the 1950s, hereditary ritual musicians in central Sri Lanka defined and categorized these timekeeping cymbal patterns simply according to the number of cymbal strokes in an ostinato cycle. Thus, the following short, short, long cymbal pattern would have been known as tuntita, literally three cymbal strokes. If this doesn't work, I might have to sing it, but let's see. <laughs> So a, a three-stroke symbol pattern would go something like one, two, three, sorry, one, two, three, 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 one, two, three could be one example of a three-stroke symbol pattern. Another example of a three-stroke symbol pattern could also be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So my argument is that practitioners would have considered these all to be three-stroke patterns. Um, so if we were to hear this, which hopefully I might not do at the end, we would hear, looking at this, these, listening to these two examples through a different analytical lens, we can hear that the three symbol strokes, at least in the first one, articulate pulse groupings of, so this example would have been 7 plus 7 plus 14. Um, and the second example would have been an example of three symbol strokes grouped in pulse groupings of 2 plus 2 plus 3. Um, as I mentioned earlier, patterns such as these with the same number of symbol strokes were considered equivalent by historical performers, 
even though from our perspective the sets of three strokes respectively materialize different ratios of duration, one to one to two versus two to two to three. Because they were considered the same, they could even be used interchangeably in, in performance. For example, let's see if this works. Um, the simple pattern Bekita, literally two strokes, could materialize a short, long pulse grouping of two plus three at the start of the piece. So one, two, one, two, one, two. And then switch to a short, long pulse grouping of three plus four later in the piece. So one, two, one, two, one, two. All the while considered to be the same two stroke symbol pattern. It would be like switching from this first pattern to this second pattern in the middle of a piece. Let's see if this works. analyze it as 7 plus 7 plus 4, ratio 1 to 1 to 2. Here's another three-stroke pattern. So again, these would have simply been three-stroke patterns. And here's my example of some two-stroke patterns which could have been it would have been like switching from this first pattern to the second pattern in the middle of a piece. Here's a two-stroke pattern. And here's another two-stroke pattern. example of the type of music and dance we're talking about. Um, I learned that it was common practice to switch um, through my interviews with senior drummers and also from the complaints embedded in the reformist discourses from the mid-20th century. And more about that. In the post-independence 1950s, Somapala and Mahulogu reinterpreted the above-mentioned symbol patterns as distinct musical meters that were, that were defined by the number of isochronous pulses within a cycle, rather than simply by the number of single strokes. They did this so that they could repackage the specialized knowledge of a marginalized ritualist community from the Sinhalese ethnic majority as national cultural heritage, and make it accessible to public schools. As Makulurwa wrote, in translation, there is no doubt that taking our system of rhythm that has been passed down continuously with our race and giving it order according to scholarly principles will result in practical ease and national pride." Unquote. Interestingly, the cultural solidarity that upper caste Makulalua expresses with marginalized people of the same ethnicity contrasts with earlier conceptions of communal identity, which were divided along lines of social class, caste, and political status, rather than ethnicity. Where did these nationalist music analysts get their ideas from? As post-colonial theorist Partha Chatterjee has argued, while cultural reform movements in colonial-era South Asia enabled colonized subjects to create autonomous cultural identities that differentiated them from the supposedly materialistic European colonizers, South Asian cultural reformers often unwittingly drew upon the intellectual frameworks of Western Orientalist scholarship in their efforts to characterize indigenous traditions. However, Chatterjee's generalization is complicated by histories in Sri Lanka. As shown by music scholar Garrett Field, 
Sri Lankan cultural nationalists positioned their identity not in relation to the colon not in relation to the colonizing West, but rather against the cultural hegemony of North India. This is particularly evident in the Hela Haula movement of Sinhala linguistic purism, which promoted political sovereignty and educational reform based on a rigorously standardized Sinhala language cleansed of North Indian loanwords. This linguistic ideology provided the main inspiration for Somapala and Mapudurva, who in the decades following political independence sought to analyze and reform Sinhali folk music in ways that highlighted difference from North Indian Hindustani music, which at the time was highly regarded in Sri Lanka. Writing in 1958, Somapala relabeled Sinhali's rhythms using terms from Sinhala poetry and redefined them in terms of the salient counts that constitute precise metered groupings of isochronous pulses, as I've shown. In doing so, he set the groundwork for a quantifiable, quote-unquote, scientific theory of Sri Lankan Sinhalese rhythm, which could stake a claim for cultural legitimacy. Somapala's descriptive theory was refined and popularized as prescriptive theory by his colleague Makulurla, who in 1962 published a treatise on the subject for use in public schools. The influence of the Sinhala language reform movement can be seen in Mapuluru's desire to insulate Sinhalese music from foreign influence, in his interest in codifying Sinhalese musical syntax as the basis of a national tradition of art music, ignoring the music of ethnic minorities, and in his opposition to Indian classical music. And as I mentioned earlier, he was able to disseminate his musical theories by riding on a wave of majoritarian identity politics that sought to establish Sinhalese culture as the dominant force in the country. However, in a broader sense, Makulolua was a product of the anti-colonial cultural movements that began in India. His search for the folk roots of Sinhalese music may have been inspired by the Indian cultural nationalist Rabindranath Tagore. Makulolua's need to analyze musical structures was inspired by the Indian musicologist S. N. Rapanjankar. Further, his writings betray the ahistorical view of static folk and ritual traditions, characteristic of early 20th century Orientalist and nationalist scholarship. In these new understandings of cyclic rhythm, the pulse grouping patterns of 2 plus 3 and 3 plus 4 were now considered to articulate different musical meters that were no longer interchangeable within a single piece. In reinterpreting these symbol patterns according to scientific-like pulse-based definitions, musicologists such as Sopala and Mapudolua um, drew on the theories of Indian classical music as they understood them, all the while asserting that Sinhalese music was fundamentally different from the musics of India. However, they may not have been aware that practitioners of Indian classical music likely began to think of their rhythm cycles in terms of grid-like pulse-based models only within the previous 70 years, during the late 19th and early 20th century colonial encounter between British and South Asian people, when there was a strive towards rationality in many intellectual spheres. Key moments in this history include the codifying of North Indian Hindustani classical music for mass education by um, B. N. B. S. Bath Khande, and the theorizing of Karnataka classical music from South India by P. Samburu. Today, the theory of rhythm categories first defined by Mapulurua and Somapala constitutes an important part of the dancing and drumming syllabi in the Sri Lankan national school curriculum and in state-run universities. The labels that they introduced for pulse-based cyclic type timekeeping patterns are still used by institutionally trained performers as a shorthand reference. Pieces of dance music are now categorized according to these labels this effectively ensures that today's performers no longer switch from one version of a timekeeping pattern to a different version of the same rhythmic contour during the course of a single piece. So they no longer would switch from two simple patterns, a two-stroke pattern plus two plus three to two plus four. That wasn't a good demonstration, sorry. Um, <laughs> interestingly, there is one particular rhythm that is still performed regularly that is not accounted for in Makulurua's system. Um, constituting five symbol strokes over seven isochronous beats. So, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. I think that's right. Did I say seven? One, 
two, three, four. One, two. One, two, three, four, five. My counting brain is not working right now. <laughs> but there's five counts. It's lot short, 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 long. Short, 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 long, long, short, 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 long, long. Yeah. Strangely, Makololu acknowledged its existence, but he dismissed it as a historical anomaly. Um, I should say, so he defined 32 new categories, he defined 32 rhythm patterns, of which only five or six are actually used, and then there's one that was actually used that didn't belong to his system, is what I'm trying to say. To summarize, during its period of hereditary oral transmission, dancers and drummers in central Sri Lanka deployed a flexible concept of rhythm based on relative rather than absolute durations of percussion strokes. Following the commodification of this dance as national culture in the mid 20th century, the associated drum rhythms became rationalized as metric cycles according to measurable time units and were codified for mass education. These scholarly theorizations form the basis for present-day understandings of rhythm, rhythmic tradition. Similar historical phenomena can be observed in the context of Indian classical music history. Although we should be careful not to attribute all such changes solely to identity politics, the ideological motivations for these trans transformations illuminate some of the ways in which <coughs> social histories can shape not just musical context, but also the very sounds of music and the way that people perceive them. Moving beyond Sri Lanka and the greater region of South Asia, I suggest tentatively that the ideas presented in this paper could also warrant re-examining musical traditions in countries such as Egypt, Tunisia, Iran, Japan, Korea, etc. to see if useful parallels in musical concepts could be drawn with other such musics that have undergone, undergone processes of classicization driven by nationalism in the 20th century and before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashanta. I'd like to invite the two speakers to put on the table, uh, sorry, not on the table, to the table. And um, this is a time for questions from the audience here and also from uh, those following online. Yes, uh, Patrick. Uh, this is for Brian. I was wondering if you might be able to uh, draw any parallels between uh, Georgian polyphony and, uh, and polyphony from other parts of the former Russian Empire because as far as I'm aware, there was peasant folk polyphony in uh, large swaths of provinces of the Russian Empire. So I was wondering what kind of connections were in terms of like heterophony or things like that. Uh, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so there's uh, the sort of the recognition of, yeah, what you could call kind of peasant polyphony in, in, in Russia, especially in kind of southern Russia, but also in, in the north. Um, was something that was going on in the early 20th century, especially some of the very first um, uh, wax cylinder recordings that were made in Russia, were made by a, a sort of uh, amateur, but you know, really important uh, uh, musicologist, uh, Yevgeny Lenyova. And um, this, it was also kind of a, a discovery in a way, because most, um, uh, uh, most collections of Russian folk music that have been published up till that point had been mostly kind of single single line melodies, so the sort of like discovery of um, of this of this like folk harmonization was something that was really exciting and, and, and something that that was clearly in the air. So I feel like in a way the the discovery of Georgian polyphony within Russian circles as well. There's a an expedition from Moscow led by a Georgian scholar, but you know funded uh, by this, this again amateur group in Moscow in, in, in 1906. Um, so, so the, the, there's an interesting question where um, the the sort of folk polyphony in in uh, in other parts of, in parts of Russia is though conceptualized a little bit differently than I think it is in Georgia. It's sort of it's seen as as um, you know really the uh, sort of unschooled. It's sort of understood as really almost like they don't know what they're doing. They add these other voice parts. It's all you know they're kind of 
it's, it's all kind of improvisational in some way. Um, whereas it's not quite connected in the same way that, that Georgian polyphony gets connected with a kind of ancient culture, like sort of ancient civilization, because Georgia has this sort of medieval culture. So there's, they're clearly like going in certain, in similar circles in the scholarship throughout the, the Soviet period, like talking about, you know, discovering and talking, and talking about polyphony in, in the sort of Russian peasant context, and also in this Caucasus context. But the particular kind of application to ideas of nation operates somewhat, somewhat differently. I hope that makes a uh, little sense. Yes, thank you. Very yeah, much. thanks. Thanks for your question. So, Brian, my question for you is: You've talked about the history of, you've given us a brief history of Georgian polyphony. You've given us a history of the history of Georgian polyphony. Uh, I'm wondering, are there any currents of revisionist history working to be more inclusive or go against sort of this nationalist strain of history that you talk uh, about? There, there is actually, there's a little bit. Um, and and it's, it's not helped in some ways by the, this really, I, I, meant, I alluded to this institution, the International Research Center for Traditional Polyphony in, in, um, uh, in Georgia, which is also very closely, very closely connected to the um, ICTM group for, for multi-part music. Um, so in a way, this, that's a very strong kind of institutional inertia to really study that kind of music, almost to the exclusion of other things. But there are projects by Georgians and non-Georgians. There a, a, was a CD called Mountain of Tongues, which took its name from that, that Arabic geographer, that was that's devoted to, to recording um, different musical traditions from the South Caucasus that don't quite fit into the same kind of national categories and stuff like that, but it's still very Yes, true. Um, uh, one question first about polyphony, and that's, uh, are there concomitant discussions of, shall we say, uh, Georgian counterpoint? Insofar as, you know, especially in that last example we heard, you know, there's, if, if polyphony is a bucket, you know, then, then counterpoint is the kind of exclusionary rule making marker of high culture, et cetera, as has been argued. Is there, is there a kind of, and this goes to the end of the second uh, presentation, is there a kind of creation of a theoretical counterpuntal framework, retroactively applied, et cetera, or at least tried to be you know, articulated uh, based on a performance tradition that could give it a kind of music theoretical option? A question, and then maybe a follow-up for the next two minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's, yeah, so the, the, the style that was being kind of pastiched a little bit in the, in the Beethoven bit, um, is from, from Western Georgia, which is known for, for this very, a lot of contrary movements, a lot of overlapping of voice parts and things like that. Um, the, the trick though is that in, 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 within Georgia, there's really a really wide variety of, of different practices, some of which seem to have, which, some of which have a single drone held and then two kind of soloists who don't actually sing together all the time, they kind of alternate or they sing in thirds for a little bit, and, 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 and other things like that. So there's there's, in a way, a kind of a retroactive assumption of everything into some idea of polyphony. So you kind of say, oh, it's all polyphony, but there's drone polyphony and contrasted polyphony and essentially what we would call homophony, you know, chordal polyphony. And, and it's in a way to sort of, I think, although, you, yes, you could kind of um, pinpoint what's, what would fit a kind of Western definition of counterpoint and what, and what wouldn't really, you know, what would just be some kind of parallelism. Um, but I think what, what I find interesting is that that constant kind of terminological slippage of, of like, like, yes, it's, it, maybe this doesn't quite fit polyphony, but since it's Georgian, it has to be polyphonic. Like, since it's kind of within this sort of cultural sphere, then let's consider, you know, polyphonic for our purposes. And then so in a way that all of the good things that accrue to the idea of polyphony, uh, of, of counterpoint as intellectual, as rule-based, kind of, they all kind of drift over into, into these other, these other genres in some way, or their absence is noted, like in the case of uh, the single voice music. Other questions? Yes. It's Peter. Um, Peter Mark. Ashanta, you, you kind of stole my the question I was going to ask to both of you, so let me just ask your question to you now. <laughs> Are there any uh, kind of revisionist views of, of you know, the, the Sri Lankan kind of immediate post-colonial codification that are happening within their own musical culture or music scholarship? 
Um, in one sense, I'd say it tends to be current ethnomusicologists coming from sort of Western schools of ethnomusicology, looking back on this history and seeing, okay, now we see that this codification is part of a broader nationalist rhetoric, which in some ways goes back to her in the 1900s and spreads across, which is its own complicated history. Um, within um, Sri Lanka, it's, I don't think so, because again, part of the history as I outlined was, it was taken from marginalized ritualists, repackaged as national culture, and now the people who are most strongly associated with this are people, institutionally trained practitioners, who are performing these dances and music on a stage. Um, so I think, sort of, the codification has been successful, and there's no reason to go beyond that, unless it's sort of a niche experimental musician who's trying to recover some other concepts. Um, so, I guess the short answer is, the codification has been successful, and no, there's, there's no, no countercurrents that I know of. Yes. So I forgot your name now. Oh, Kristen. Kristen, thank you. Yeah, I had a quick question for Shanta. Just you mentioned the sort of 30, 32 rhythmic patterns of which some are used and one exists but isn't done there. I'm just curious if you could say a bit more about the purpose of the patterns that aren't actually used. Are they sort of mathematically theoretical or how, how do they fit into this system? Yeah. So, Maybe I should have explained that more, um, which I will do now. Um, so Makulalua discovered, or he was aware of a, a, a traditional poem verse used by ritualists, which referred to 32 thalam. Um, so thalam, in some Indian context, refers to rhythmic cycles. Um, in other folk South Asian traditions, it just refers to rhythm, rhythm patterns. Um, but either way, so there's this traditional verse that exists that says there are 32 thalam. So Makulalu figured, okay, there needs to be, we need to recover this, these 32 which were lost during colonialism. Um, and his way of recovering it was to be like, okay, when I do combinations of twos and threes, I can come up with this set of 32. Um, so he came up with a set of 32 of which, as I mentioned, five or six were still being used. Um, so that worked perfectly well for him. And then he had to account for, or he didn't account for this other one that couldn't be created from his system of adding twos and threes. And so his explanation was, well, this is, this is a version of this other one in my system of 32. <laughs> so, yeah. Other questions? Hot? For Brian, um, thank you both for your talks. It's really wonderful. Um, Kind of a follow-up to Drew's question. It doesn't sound as if there's, you know, a treatise that one can go look up. Maybe we'll give rules of, you know, uh, Georgian polyphony. Um, but I'm wondering if you've looked at pedagogical context. Like, how is how is this music, you know, uh, what's the process of transmission of, of teaching? Um, are the, are the rules are there rules that are implicitly codified there? And and I guess the other thing is if you have a sense of this discourse um, and the methods. Is this kind of, is the dialectic of exclusive and national and inclusive and hybrid? Is that evident in the in the pedagogy? Mm. I'll think that I'll think about that second part. Um, but but in terms of the the, the question of uh, pedagogy and, and transmission, it's a little it's complicated by the um, the Soviets. Decades of of, uh, of of institutionalization of, of folk ensembles and things like that. Um, it, from from you know from reading sort of ethnographic accounts and things like that, um, it seemed like the process of of and, and actually I should make a distinction between here the secular and sacred traditions because there's um, sort of secular folk music um, was typically understood to be something that you kind of picked up. Like you sort of, there wasn't, there's not like a kind of a guru tradition or anything like that. You just kind of picked it up, but maybe you 
but there was there were like a lot of small kind of landowning gentry in, in, in Georgia, especially Western Georgia, and they might like hire you to kind of be you know a singer. So there was definitely some a professionalization, but not necessarily uh, a kind of a training regimen that, that always happened. So this I so and that tends to be just how people learn the songs and they kind of pick them up at home. Contrasting that with the Orthodox chant tradition, which was in monastery centers, and that must have been much more, you know, much more regimented because there's actually a single uh, upper vocal, upper chant line, the top voice in that case, is, is pretty standard, um, but then the way that the two lower parts are harmonized improvis improvisationally varies a great deal from, from one center to the next. So, so you have to imagine a different process there. But, but I will say there's an interesting question that, that I'm interested, that interests me about the transmission, which is that today, it's not that hard to go on Facebook and find uh, like a, a singing tour where you can kind of go to Georgia and work with some song masters and, and learn some songs and, uh, and have a great time. Uh, I, but what's noteworthy is that the singers that get hired for those and that I had these kind of long-standing relationships with Western organizations are the ones who are most able to teach one part at a time. Like, a lot of fantastic singers don't really seem to think of it that way. So the, the kind of the particular pedagogical ability to just like, to stick to one part or whatever uh, is something that's a very learned practice. That's not, you know, kind of inherent in that tradition. Thank you. I think we should, I think we should leave it here. Um, because it's already 10 after 3, and we need to move on to the next session. Thank you very much for two very rich presentations. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get started with our next session. And starting off this session, we have Patrick Domico, who is a PhD candidate in musicology at Indiana University in Bloomington. His dissertation examines modernism and the Russian musical um, immigration in Paris in the United States in the 1920s through 40s. His other research on Nikolai Metner um, has appeared in Nikolai Metner Music Aesthetics and Contexts from 2021. This paper was co-authored with Lucy Liu, who is not going to be able to join us today, so instead we just have Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I believe someone's going to turn the volume up a little bit more for me. Uh, when we tested it out, it was kind of uh, soft. Okay. Let me test it out here before I get started. Let's see. Probably loud enough, I guess. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Nikolai Metner, in his 1935 book, Musa y Moda, in English, The Mood, The Muse, and The Fashion, wrote, quote, We exiles scattered all over the world, detached from all heritage and succession, must earn our works of art by hard labor like miners, no longer able to pluck them like the flowers of the fields as we saunter through. He uses his experience as a Russian immigrant who fled his war-torn homeland as an allegory for the fate of a different nation, the imagined country of those few who still speak the tonal musical language. As a leading Muscovite symbolist composer prior to his immigration in 1921, Metner was surprised to find himself unknown and unwanted in the West, 
a West that had abandoned his cherished musical values for the latest modernist fashions, or so he thought. He felt this spiritual exile from like-minded composers as keenly as his physical exile, blaming modernism for the degeneration of the tonal musical language and the weakening of music's power to produce collective, unifying experiences. Metner's anti-modernist book, published with the support of Rachmaninoff, staunchly defends his beliefs by presenting a unified theory of tonal music. This theory revolves around belief in a, quote, primordial song as music's divine origin. Composers, like prophets, perceive its eternal themes through sudden flashes of inspiration. Uninterrupted contemplation of these inspired themes justifies the action and work of music composition itself. Furthermore, such themes can hypnotically, quote, plunge the listener into contemplative oblivion. Yet the discordant sounds of modernism and the modern world have dulled many composers' perception of the primordial song and its themes, disconnecting their creations from music's divine, unified source. Metner's idiosyncratic presentation of common theoretical concepts, for example, cadence, modulation, theme, and form, cannot be untangled from this cosmology and from the personal need for music to embody the unity absent from his own itinerant life. He examines the musical language and defines its senses. This is a neologism he coined uh, to describe those elements allowing for sense or meaning and comprising music's so-called eternal laws of harmony and counterpoint. Metner claims these senses are governed by a, quote, general law of coordination into unity, which he notes has not been put down by music theory, but which undoubtedly governs the whole macrocosm of music. This law is first illustrated in Metner's book with a table of paired concepts in which the terms on the right-hand column gravitate towards and encircle the terms on the left-hand column, producing unity. For Metner, unity is not simplistic, but emerges through the proper coordination of the complexity inherent in musical language. The most fundamental unifying sense of music is the inspired theme, which is intuited from perception of the primordial song, and serves as the singular ineffable law governing an individual work. The theme is the most simple and accessible part of the work. It unifies it and holds within itself the clue to all the subsequent complexity and variety. Each inspired theme bears all the elements and senses of the musical language. It has its own pulse rhythm, its own chiaroscuro harmony, its own breathing cadences, and its own perspective form. Often it needs other themes as its vassals, suggesting them, calling them forth. It often reveals in its own flowering their seeds. Metner employs his characteristic coordination encirclement terminology in discussions of the theme's relationship to other musical parameters, which we interpret via this chart. So this chart is our interpretation of Metner's disparate statements on the topic. Three elements encircle the theme. The developed thematic materials acquired through intuitive contemplation, that's the first row, the intrathematic formal functions which articulate phrases, that's the second, and the senses of harmony as governed by the interrelation of tonic and dominant in the third row. This system supports a multi-parameter approach to music analysis, embracing thematic, harmonic, and form functional perspectives, and is not reducible simply to motivic analysis. We turn to the second movement of the Sonata Idol, Opus 56, in sonata form and composed just after Metner published his book to showcase the following. One, his approach to thematic development rooted in the need to constantly return to his themes in different contexts and arrangements. Two, his idiosyncratic use of cadential and continuation functions as thematic content-bearing units which loosen the theme's presentation resist liquidation, and generate a pervasive developmental field. And three, his novel conception of the dominant 
as both a device capable of modulating anywhere and as a flexible tool to connect distant chromaticism back to the tonic. Mettner describes the intuition of a theme as, quote, an unexpected illumination of its image as by a flash of lightning, after which the artist need only recall it and mentally reconstruct its disappearing contours, end quote. The composer's practice of continually contemplating and reconstructing intuitive themes is illustrated in Mettner's music by specific procedures of thematic exposition and development. His thematic expositions tend to be incomplete, as if a theme cannot be wholly remembered, and his developmental techniques include many thematic recontextualizations, recombinations, and reorderings in which vassal themes are recruited to illuminate various aspects of the main theme. The Sonata Idol's three-key exposition follows the standard one, three, five key trajectory. None of these three keys are confirmed with an authentic cadence, resulting in expositional failure due to the second subordinate theme's lack of essential expositional closure. S2 itself feels incomplete. And please see example one. Its first nine bar phrase heads towards an authentic cadence, evaded through elision with the next phrase. The same melody then recurs over a chromatically descending bass, with its final cadential progression twice repeated before halting on a G minor added sixth chord. This prepares the surprise imitative recall of the main theme in G minor, the tonic minor, blocking the attainment of the EEC and preventing S2 from achieving tonal stability or rhetorical solidity. Indeed, no cadence appears at all to close the exposition as tonic minor slips down a fifth to C dominant seventh. Let's listen to S2 in the exposition. This D major, G minor, C major progression initiates a descending circle of fifths, continuing with F major to begin the development right after the point in which the recording stopped, and moving to B major as the retransition standing on the dominant. The next step, E minor, happens to be the key of the first subordinate theme down a fifth, and Metner takes advantage of this to bring back S1 verbatim as the start of the recapitulation. S1 is not followed by S2, but by the return of the main theme in the tonic, reordering the recapitulation's themes and confounding the forward rotational logic expected of sonata form. Furthermore, the only strongly marked climactic moment in the movement accompanies the return of the lyrical S2 in the tonic, prepared by a lengthy dominant prolongation and yielding an apotheosis or spiritual vision as if the theme has been remembered vividly. S2's melody is recapitulated as a complete eight bar phrase, this time attaining a PAC in the tonic. Please see example two in the handout. The melody is then repeated in diminution, intercutting with modified recalls of the main theme in triplets, and is then followed by no less than three chromatic sequences that eventually congeal on five of four. At this point, the Marshall S1 theme intervenes alongside the structural predominant, allowing for the attainment of a central structural closure. Drawing the main theme together with its subordinates 
and a unifying confluence, Metner dramatizes the achievement of the ESC as a product of thematic development. Metner asserts, asserts that the building blocks of phrases and longer forms derive from the primordial song and its eternal laws of harmony, which, quote, determine the fundamental senses of form construction, define the strong beat, and determine the place of form, standstill, departure, return, beginning, middle, end, etc. end quote. Of these Kaplanian formal functions, the cadence takes on the primary role of coordinating force, in Metner's terminology, by demarcating various levels of form. Quote, the cadence is not a conventional bow. It is not dictated by the rules of politeness. It is imposed by the law that governs the breathing of musical thought. It does not impede that breathing. On the contrary, it regulates it and thereby gives it freedom. End quote. By regulating music's phrase structure, cadences, quote, determine the fundamental constructions of form, phrases, periods, binary song form, etc., yet at the same time efface the boundary lines and postpone the completion of form, thereby opening it up for a still wider perspective, end quote. In Metner's music, this forward-looking use of the cadence often triggers the proliferation of continuation functions, expanding the phrase structure while developing the theme. The Sonata Idol's main theme area, please see example three, begins with an asymmetrical three-bar compound basic idea, followed by a four-bar continuation, which cadences on minor two, resulting in a modulating seven-bar sentence. Without a prior cadence and tonic, this PAC on two actually propels the larger compound phrase forward and accentuates the theme's modal qualities. Here, we argue Metner uses a cadential progression as a part of the initial presentation of the theme and not just as a formal marker, as a means to immediately develop his material without first providing a stable phrase. In bar eight, a proliferation of continuation functions ensues all of which are derived from the left hand's chromatically descending accompaniment pattern in bars one to two. Example three shows the two overlapping descending tetrachords, a tonic and a dominant version, that are mined for melodic and baseline material. The tetrachords appear prominently four times in the soprano as the first continuation is repeatedly transposed from bar eight onward. The theme's melodic peak arrives in bar 13 strikingly in the parallel minor, and drives to the half cadence, ending the main theme area. Let's hear that. In the span of only 15 bars, Metner obsessively revisits elements derived from his compound basic idea and its continuation, building his main theme through the accretion of small recursive variations. Indeed, the choice here to write a brief modulating sentence followed by transpositions of continuation-derived fragments is unusual for a main theme, a conventionally tight-knit space. The loosening strategies typical of continuation units are used to develop the theme's melodic and harmonic tendencies right away. Yet Menner's treatment of his material differs from those procedures associated with the Beethoven Brahms tradition. As his chosen units are longer than a few notes, and he manipulates more than just a characteristic contour, rhythm, or pair of chords. Metner posits harmony to be the, quote, principal encirclement of the theme asserting that harmony acquires the seal of inspiration only in its gravitation towards it, end quote. Harmonic practice is defined by those musical senses gradually discovered by humanity through continual contemplation of the primordial song, and which Metner organizes into this chart here. The resultant tonal formulas 
derived after centuries of humanity's engagement with intuitions of the primordial song, these tonal formulas never grow stale and re retain an enduring incantational power, in Metner's terms, akin to, quote, ancient prayers. This chart is made up of a bunch of nested binaries, basically, which we have untangled and summarized in our own kind of interpretive scheme here. Um, two senses coordinate the rules of voice leading, the gravitation to the tonic of other notes in the scale and the gravitation, gravitation of dissonant intervals and chords toward consonances. The determinant or, quote, coordinate of tonality is the dominant triad because of the consonant diatonic triads, only it possesses, quote, both the leading tones that gravitate most directly towards the tonic, end quote. Yet the dominant also represents, quote, the movement of tonalities from one to the other, which found its simplest formula in the so-called circle of fifths, end quote. To Metner, a complexity that encircles and thus coordinates a particular unity also carries within it the capacity to move away from that unity. Thus, the dominant serves two self-contradictory roles as, quote, the symbol of direct gravitation towards the tonic as well as the symbol of movement or temporary departure from it, end quote. Expounding on this latter point, Metner makes the unusual claim that the dominant seventh and ninth chords, quote, possess the greatest flexibility for modulation. And through the inharmonic substitution of certain notes, these chords, the dominant seventh and ninth chords, move directly into the triads or their inversions of nearly all existing tonalities, end quote. Indeed, Metner employs unusual resolutions of dominant chords to expand his chromatic palette and modulatory scope without necessarily relying on the kinds of symmetrical octave divisions with their non-tonal implications that became commonplace in late 19th century musical writing. Take the sonata's first transition from one to minor three, see example four. After the main theme's half cadence in bar 15, Metner inverts the D dominant into a 5-4-2 with C in the bass. This undermines the half cadence's form-defining strength and implies that the main theme is not yet over. However, 5-4-2 persists for four bars, supporting a transposed recall of the main theme before alighting into an illusory C dominant seventh and initiating a thematic repetition a step higher. Overall, 5-4-2's function is ambiguous as the dominant's gravitation towards the tonic is eroded until it is co-opted as a modulatory device. Finally, C dominant seventh moves to a C sharp half diminished seventh via common tone motion uh, to reach two in the goal key of B, B minor. Let's listen to this transition here. In Metner's thinking, Chromaticism must always encircle the unifying tonic key. <coughs> Parsimonious and common tone voice leading, usually believed to weaken the tonal system, must be strategically employed instead to enhance the tonic's control over chromatic regions. For example, Metner often indulges in chromatically fluid cadences, which maneuver as far away as possible from the tonic and back in a highly compressed time span. In these instances, the dominant serves less as a major arrival point and more as the coordinating bridge between such remote areas and the tonic. A short post-ESC cadential passage will illustrate this point. See example five. Here we quickly move a tritone away from the tonic and back within the span of only two bars. The rapid remote tonicizations create a tonally disorienting effect. C minor, Minor four initiates a chromatic predominant region prolonged through smooth five to six exchanges 
and leading to a remote D-flat major triad sounding as four in the locally tonicized key of A-flat. Returning home requires enharmonic trickery. The consonant D-flat in the bass turns into a dissonant chordal seventh once E-flat is introduced above it. This E-flat dominant 4-2 is then reinterpreted with D-flat becoming C-sharp as a German diminished third, sharing two common tones with C minor, which easily resolves to the home key dominant. In a nutshell, Metner's preoccupation with harnessing chromatic voice leading to create novel credential formulae is put on display. Let's hear that. And let's hear it again since it's so short. In conclusion, Metner was one of the last European composers to experience tonality as a universal practice and perceive modernism to be not an expansion of expressive devices, but as the disintegration of a communal language and identity, producing a metaphysical feeling of exile, compounding the sense of loss produced by his physical immigration. His impassioned defense of tonality <coughs> set out to identify and affirm its fundamental laws while conducting a, quote, exorcism of those modern compositional practices which were thought to degrade it. Metner's case provides a vivid example of a composer who believed music to possess a unifying spiritual power foundational to the rapidly degenerating Western world. His music theory thus possesses a profound urgency and monumental scope and serves as both a battleground for the spiritual welfare of Europe, in his view, <coughs> and a point of resistance against modernist change. Metner's writings thus are a locus in which issues of personal identity intersect with a novel account of modernism as a destructive social force. His case illustrates how seemingly conservative music theory can serve new functions and goals despite the so-called eternal nature of its laws. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for that. And why don't we follow the same format as the previous session? So we'll hold our questions until the end. And as Kristen is approaching and going to get set up, I will go ahead and bio. How do you pronounce your last name, Kristen? Francine. Oh, sorry, Francine. Thank you. <laughs> Kristen Francine is a, a postdoctoral fellow in history and research, um, excuse me, in history and a research associate at the Simone de Beauvoir Institute at Concordia University, where her research is supported by the Fonds de Recherche du Québec, Société Couture. Her book, Imagining Musical Pasts, The Queer Literary Musicology of Vernon Lee, Rosa Newmarch, and Edward Prime Stevenson is forthcoming from Clemson University Press. Let's welcome Kristen. to be here um, in person in, in New Orleans. Um, and I'm also just really happy um, kind of to echo um, some of August's comments at the beginning to, to think more deeply about the idea of the ways in which um, a, a scholar's identity um, and sort of historical context might influence um, the, the sorts of work uh, that they produce. And I think that's it'll be a really interesting through line, I think, through um, several of the, the papers today and tomorrow and at some of the um, history of theory and history of musicology things going on at the, the larger conference later this week. Um, so, so this talk I'm giving today, um, an autobiographical interest in which, for which there is no real warranty, um, is taken from um, two kind of different but related projects I'm working on. One, the, the book project that I'm hopefully finishing up on um, the kind of relationships and um, methodological connections between um, the uh, aesthetic philosopher and horror writer Vernon Lee, 
um, the Tchaikovsky biographer and poet Rosa Newmarch, and the music critic turned amateur sexologist Edward Prime Stevenson as a way of thinking about a kind of proto-queer musicology around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and then sort of the project I am very slowly moving into um, is a, a broader history of gossip and unreliable sources um, within the sort of European composer biography, um, using in particular the case of um, Antonio Salieri as a sort of case study in unreliable um, biographical sources and biofiction. Um, and in my talk today, I'm going to look at um, Newmarch's writings on um, music that has to do with the depths of Mozart and Tchaikovsky um, as one example of how um, she as a figure who was both celebrated and marginalized within early 20th century British musicology and public music theory um, kind of grappled with questions of reliability and authorial intent um, in, in writing about some of these works. Um, so in my talk today, I'll sort of give a brief overview of um, some kind of scholarship on uh, the history of gossip uh, in the last 20 years and kind of what that might have to do with music. Um, I'll explore uh, a rare example of Newmarch's reflections on her role um, as an analyst. Uh, she very famously wrote a collection of program notes originally uh, for the proms that were later published as a kind of um, home education guide, as it were, to thinking about things like musical form. Um, and then I'll turn to uh, her commentary to her translation of Rimsky-Kosakov's Mozart and Salieri and the passage on the Pathétique in her first Tchaikovsky biography to think about how she um, grapples with historical gossip as both a, a very strong skeptic and also someone who is aware uh, that her, her reading public, especially her uh, non-academic public, is very invested in some of these sensational stories. Um, and I'll, I'll conclude with some preliminary thoughts about the role identity plays um, both for Newmarch in her works and also among some of her more famous readers. So why? Why am I talking about gossip? Um, for, for the one thing, um, in, in my, my work on kind of the, the early proto-history, if you will, of, of queer musicology, um, questions of unreliable sources and counter-narratives and unexpected um, claims uh, crop up a lot when you have um, communities and people looking for histories kind of outside of um, established structures. Um, and I'm especially here drawing from the, the work of art historian um, Gavin Butt and queer theorist uh, Jose Esteban Munoz um, in thinking about sort of community functions of gossip um, in kind of particular artistic circles. Um, but I also just briefly want to mention that it's also important to think about um, the political functions of gossip as both a tool of political resistance, as Louise White um, talks about in colonial and post-colonial Africa, and also a tool of political control, as um, Matthew Elias's recent book on J. Edgar Hoover, Joe McCarthy, and Roy Cohn's attempts to both control gossip about their masculinity and sexuality while also weaponizing very similar gossip directed against others um, demonstrates. Um, and musical gossip, I argue, links uh, a person or a community emotional connection with a particular performer or work, very broadly defined, um, to ideas of not just community membership but also an appeal to secret or hidden or esoteric knowledge. Um, and I think that's something I think any of us who have taught a, a music appreciation or a first year theory class can relate to. This, um, oftentimes I think our students think we have uh, secret or esoteric or hidden knowledge um, 
to impart to them. Um, and one of the, the folks who's, who's done a lot of work on this with regards to more recent musical gossip is, is Paula Harper, um, who is in the process of publishing um, a paper she gave at SLAM a couple years ago about uh, the conspiracy theories surrounding um, queer readings of Taylor Swift's music on social media. So, um, turning to Rosa Newmarch. Um, as I mentioned, Newmarch was, was best known during her lifetime as an author of program notes and a scholar of Russian and, and Eastern European musics, um, in particular, um, her vol voluminous writings on the life and works and writings and letters of Tchaikovsky. Um, and I was really excited in sort of, after reading a great deal of her musicology, to come across a reference to this, this very short article she wrote um, for the Chesterian magazine uh, on um, being what she called a program writer. Um, she's thinking in terms of program notes for the general public. Um, but I think a lot, of, a lot of what she writes, we might also think of as in some ways applicable to, to music theorists and musicologists, um, particularly those operating kind of between academic and public spheres. Um, and this article also functions as a form of advertising Newmarch's public theory as she sort of begins talking about how she got into writing program notes and how um, you know, some, there was some debate amongst her colleagues and editors as to whether or not you know, a woman could handle doing that. Um, but she also mentions um, early on in this article uh, that she has a, a collection of her program notes kind of coming out soon. Um, so very aware of, of her intended reader. Um, but what I'm excited about kind of in this article is the way she positions um, herself as, as, as she puts it, annotator in relation uh, to both the musical public, um, you know, viewing the, the annotator as a sort of invisible figure um, who is less visible to the audience than the, the instrument porters and piano tuners. Um, and also in relation to the composer. Um, and this is something that comes up um, kind of a great deal in her Tchaikovsky scholarship, the sort of connections between sort of her writing a life of Tchaikovsky um, and also wanting to let his letters and, and diaries and music criticism kind of speak for themselves. Um, and here, um, I really want to draw your attention to the line um, about uh, cautiously led on um, by the theorist. The composer will make psychological revelations and give up clues that are invaluable. And if the annotator refrains from catechizing and remembers that hints are not facts, he will certainly find himself in a better position when he comes to look into a brand new unperformed score. Um, and it's interesting here that Newmarch is talking about the annotator theoretically working with new scores, as, as much of her own writings um, had to do with canonical music, um, as she sort of alludes to at the start of the next paragraph, how much more explicit Beethoven might have been if he had come in contact with the right sort of programmist. Um, and this the relationship between sort of composers, particularly living composers, and um, the programmist is beyond the scope of this paper, but I'm happy to perhaps theorize about that more during the discussion. Um, so I, I'd like to turn now to uh, two instances of Newmarch engaging with some, some hints that are definitely not facts. Um, as far as her engagement uh, with Rimsky-Korsakov's adaptation of Pushkin's uh, tragedy, Mozart and Salieri, and the rumors, uh, very popular in Britain during her lifetime, of Tchaikovsky's alleged suicide. Um, so Newmarch's translation, uh, published uh, 
based on advertisements sometime around 1919 um, is, it's an English translation of Pushkin's text, um, that interestingly predates uh, the UK premiere of the opera. Um, and even more interesting, um, a picture of New March in Chilapin. I, I don't know, oh no, oh no. That's unfortunate. Um, I don't know if Newmarch was at the, the premiere in 1927. I'm still trying to um, figure that out, but there we are, we're back. Um, one of the things um, that is particularly useful for my bigger project here is um, Newmarch's commentary um, to the work. Um, and, and this is sort of the first paragraph of about uh, three quarters of a page, um, kind of the first section is providing um, kind of historical context and then there's a, just a plot summary. Um, and uh, in this section, um, Newmarch sort of, there's this tension between, you know, immediately wanting to debunk the gossip um, that she knows is not true and then like show off her sources, like where did this come from? Um, and we can talk about the sort of uh, inaccuracies in, in her, her sources there, um, including the, the misdating of the Gustave Nicolet novella, um, which that misdating almost certainly comes from Otto Jan. Um, and uh, pitch for my talk on Friday, um, where I will be exploring um, a number of unreliable 19th century sources, including Der Music Fein by Gustav Nicolet. Um, but uh, what's interesting to me here, um, kind of what's going on in this passage, sort of unpacking the gossip, is um, it seems to me like, oh, it seems to me like Newmarch is being very aware of kind of what is of interest to a public that has not seen this opera perform. Um, so we have um, immediately this question of the truth or falsehood of the story and the historical sources such as they existed at the time for the gossip, um, the, the context for the opera. She goes on to speculate a bit about why this story may have been um, of particular interest to Pushkin. Um, but there are also some surprising omissions given her place as an annotator and in also given um, the literary history of um, the sort of readings of the, the Mozart and Salieri relationship to that point. Um, so she, while she, well the sources she cites are, are quite uh, nationalistic in their, their treatment of, of both composers, um, she really doesn't get into that. She sort of talks um, abstractly about, about sort of jealousy and, and intrigue, um, but she, she doesn't put a, a nationalist or, or linguistic reading on that. Um, there's also no discussion uh, in this text of Rimsky-Korsakov's musical quotations from um, Mozart's uh, Figaro and from Salieri's uh, Terrar, um, which in, in her program notes uh, would be kind of a major feature kind of explaining interesting musical references. Um, and just to, to move on um, to uh, the, the question of kind of biographical or autobiographical readings of, of music and supposed musical allusions to things in history. Um, I also wanted to consider uh, this passage uh, from uh, her Newmarch's first Tchaikovsky biography where she's discussing the, the, what she calls the extraordinary popularity of the Patetique, um, and from which I get the title of my talk today, the idea that it has been infested with an autobiographical quality or interest for which there is no real warranty. Um, and she mentions, um, alludes to sort of autobiographical readings of, of death into the work. Um, she mentions the sensationalist suicide rumor. And then again, she's, she's very interested in, um, you know, that I, she hasn't found um, grounding for it. Um, now, she may not have found grounding for it, but 
she and her publisher were certainly very aware that, um, you know, one of the reasons someone in uh, sort of the English-speaking world in 1900 would pick up a book on Tchaikovsky is that they were curious about all of these rumors swirling about the Patatique. Um, and in fact, the, the cover of um, Tchaikovsky, his life and works, includes, it's hard to tell them, these, these two gold medallions on the, the dark red background, um, but the one on the right is an image of Tchaikovsky, and the one on the left is the famous theme from the Adagio Lamentoso to the Patatique. So even the sort of physical object of the book is sort of playing into um, the sort of mythology that's forming around the piece less than a decade after Tchaikovsky's death. Um, and in um, in the sort of extant scholarship on New March, um, to which um, I am also <laughs> contributing, um, there's a great deal of discussion about what she may or may not have known or have been told um, about Tchaikovsky's sexuality. Um, Malcolm Hamrick Brown uh, floats the idea in, in 2002 that she um, was probably told something but sort of politely uh, declined to mention it. Um, more recently, folks like Philip Bullock and Nastasha Distiller have um, looked into kind of homosociality within Newmarch's circle and, and personal and professional relationships, um, and in particularly um, a potential queer reading of her poem, The Symphony, um, a poem about the Patatique, um, to her, her relationship with her longtime companion, Bella Simpson. Um, there's also a semi-established history of uh, queer readers of Newmarch's biography sort of reading, um, reading the, the sexuality and the subtext back in. Um, and E.M. Forster, in his famous Locked Diary, talks about reading um, either Newmarch's biography or, or her translation of Modeste's biography, um, and that sort of inspiring the scene uh, in Morris, where Morris and Risley discuss the Patatique. Um, and the, the American critic Edward Prime Stevenson in his history of homosexuality, The Intersexes from 1909, um, alludes to critics, uh, which he does not name, sort of assiduously trying to debunk the suicide rumor and the sort of back and forth between kind of tragic queer readings of the pathetique and biographical scholarship. Um, so moving towards the conclusion, um, Newmarch herself uh, had a great deal of personal skepticism towards uh, received anecdotes about um, composers and sort of reading um, these stories of personal identity and autobiography into music. Um, although she was also very aware that this was something of interest to popular audiences. Um, and she held an expansive view of her scholarship that included both works um, that were cited by folks like Edward Dent and also works meant to appeal to the audiences at the proms. Um, and I still, what I'm grappling, still grappling with with her work here is the idea that the programmist should be invisible. Um, and this is something that crops up in biographical writings she did of personal friends of hers like Henry Wood and um, Mary Wakefield, uh, where she's sort of kind of ambiguous about where does she fit into these stories. Um, and it also matches up with contemporary descriptions of her creative writing. So the French critic Charles Chassé um, described her sonnet cycles as finally being her own song to sing rather than scholarship on other people's works. Um, so I know I'm at time here, um, and I, I, I mentioned this earlier, um, but one of the sort of important things in thinking about her Tchaikovsky project and kind of how identity fits into there is her awareness of the limits of what she could know um, about Tchaikovsky's life. Um, so she, she very much wanted to let his writing speak for themselves, um, but she also was aware that there were archival materials that the family would not let um, researchers see. Um, and so yeah, I'm just sort of grappling with what does this all mean and sort of how does um, kind of her place as a 
possibly queer woman in music history and theory kind of fit into all of these big questions we're asking about identity and history and theory. So thank you. for questions before our break. So, Stefano, do you want to go first? Thank you. Uh, for, for both papers, I, I have a question for, for Kismet. Your paper is fascinating. Um, it seems to me that her, that um, Newmarch is uh, ravishing in visibility. I wonder if it could be a sign of uh, the sort of, 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 um, of, of, of objectivity. Of wanting, wanting to guarantee to the to the to the public that it, that, that she's speaking truthfully, so she it seems to me that she's mentioning she's reporting gossip as a way to distancing herself from it, as a way this this is the the uh, you know the the fake stuff out there you know the, the, the fake news that we have to reject, and I'm 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 bringing you to this you know, more reliable, truthful report of of historical composition and so uh, that's that's my, my one comment that, that comes to mind. Yeah, thank you. I love the idea of sort of bringing up gossip in order to reject it or distance yourself from it. I mean, it's something, I'm never going to get the exact quote, but in her biography of the conductor Henry Wood, um, she sort of raises this question of can she be objective because they were personal friends. Um, very early on, and she says something along the lines of that it's especially hard to write a biography of a living subject because there are some things that should not be said during a man's lifetime. And yeah, I know, I definitely think that there is this framework, like for, like the, the music can be subjective, but the, the, the sort of history in her mind um, does seem to be very, uh, try to be very objective. I had a question for, for Patrick. Um, thank you uh, for the talk. I wonder if you would be willing to, or able to talk a little bit uh, more about the, the circumstances surrounding this exile. And uh, uh, I don't know a ton of his, his biographical story. Like, was, was he at all connected with like the Eurasianist movement? Like the sort of, the idea of like unity is something that I feel is one of these kind of concepts going around in Mondo, the kind of uh, Russian exiles. So so if that's you know, something you could talk about relevant to you. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little of his story in a nutshell. Um, he was, he lost his house after the revolution, had to go in kind of internal exile to a friend's dacha outside of Moscow, and then finally decided to immigrate in 1921, uh, both because he thought maybe he would have better career prospects abroad uh, although that didn't turn out to be the case, and also because it was just simply uncertain how safe things would be in Russia at that point. I mean, he had been close to being arrested, been bourgeois, things like that. Um, he was not connected in any way, shape, or form to the Eurasianist movement uh, because he, given his German last name, he was uh, a few generations removed from Baltic German ancestry, basically. But his family, especially his brother, you might know Emil Metner, was uh, probably the most prominent figure in the Moscow Symbolist movement and was known for introducing Goethe, Kant, and Wagner, and really uh, trying to heavily influence people like Andre Gilly in, uh, in the German tradition, and that included also his brother Nikolai Metner. So Metner was always considered to be a German composer, although he himself kind of viewed viewed himself as a Russian composer with German leanings. And um, one of the major reasons why he was obsessed with unity is because he was coming out of the German romantic tradition. Um, and he hoped to find 
uh, his cherished musical values in Germany when he arrived there in 1921, but he felt like um, it was gone. And he felt that everyone had just fallen for what he called modernist fashions, had abandoned the muse, had abandoned the uh, proper values that humanity had discovered over centuries. And, uh, those are his terms, basically. And um, he did have a somewhat metaphysical view, though, of music as capable of producing collective experiences and basically of manifesting a kind of divine spiritual sense or feeling of unity on earth. I have a question from Patrick as well. Um, you talk about Bechner's animosity towards the modernists. Um, I'm just wondering if you know, um, I'm generally curious, um, did modernism, so modernism dominates our history books, our textbooks, but did modernism actually dominate musical life in Germany at the time? When Bechner's complaining, is he just complaining about the most respected elite composers of the time? So my question is, did German Romanticism ever go out of fashion with the German listening public? Right, so in his view, yes, because he, no one was hiring him for performances or no critics were giving him due regard or anything like that, in distinction to some of his trips to Germany in 1908, for example. Uh, his view of modernism included people like Richard Strauss and Thomas Schrecker. Schrecker had a post at Berlin Conservatory, if I recall. And obviously, Richard Strauss is probably the most prominent composer in Germany at the time. Uh, so he, he, he kind of viewed modernism as encompassing this uh, disintegration of the ability of the tonic to rule over large swaths of chromaticism, which included uh, musical developments even prior to Schoenberg and Stravinsky and things like that. About Schoenberg and Stravinsky, he, would, he basically couldn't even talk about them because he viewed them as just so far gone that they were like demonic forces or something. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think one, one of the important things about Mender's case is that, that so many music scholars today are trying to broaden the purview of modernism. Even conservative composers, English pastoralists, anybody you can think of who is reacting to the, you know, the traumas of the 20th century are modernists in their own way. But I think that loses some of the uh, importance of considering modernism to be that experimental attitude towards music with how it was understood at the time and for most of the 20th century because that attitude towards music itself had detractors, people on the other side, people who viewed that as uh, decidedly destructive. So you could try to like recoup Metner into modernism by like, oh, look at this modulation, it's so cool. Like, you know, Brahms couldn't have even done it like that or something. But, you know, I think that would lose some of the uh, kind of historical value that his case would have. But Metner would have considered Richard Strauss to be a modernist. Yes. One, let's do one more question before our break. Who, who will it be? Sheffy or August? Go ahead. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. August. Um, well, it's it, it may be one of those more comment than question things, but um, I'm fascinated, uh, Kristen, by this the line from Newmarch comparing the programmist and the composer to psychoanalyst and patient. And in, in particularly, I, I'm curious whether Newmarch I imagined she did, but whether you have any evidence that she read Freud. Um, and then Freud's view that biography was essentially an impossible genre, right? Because you could, you either couldn't write it because you weren't, didn't know anything or weren't close enough, or you were too close to be objective, mm -hmm. right? And then thinking about Stefano's point about establishing objectivity, but doing it in a way that gives an awful lot of airtime to the gossip, <laughs> right? It, it's, this, it's this really interesting dynamic that, um, that I think can be at play to even in the most, you know, quote unquote, rigorously objective music analysis, right? We're always close to the music, we're always close to the, in some way, and that's something that the, your, your work at Newmark really brings out. Yeah, oh gosh, I don't, I would have to go back and look at her letters to look for references to Freud. Um, I could, based 
on how she uses the term psychoanalysis elsewhere in some of her writings. I'm trying to think. I think it crops up in one of her Grove articles, um, possibly the one on Tchaikovsky, where she's talking about, again, what she sees as sort of overly autobiographical readings. Um, I, I just could see her being very skeptical of that, but obviously she's grappling with exactly what Freud is talking about, where she, um, in some cases, wants to be extremely objective, but then she keeps writing, but she also writes, like I said, biographies of close personal friends, or she writes poetry about the music she likes, where she can be as subjective as she wants. Um, and so it, it does seem to be something um, of, of great interest to her and of great um, kind of frustration with maybe what um, not just music biography or, or kind of music research more generally should be um, in this time. That they're um, just thinking a few decades after her, there's that horrible quote by that Sachs who says something in, in the 50s where you know nowadays any girl that you know transcribes something from Grove can call herself a musicologist. Um, and of course, Newmarch was contributing to Grove in the 19-teens, so I think there's, there's a lot to be said there about kind of who's allowed into what spaces at what time um, as well, and what they're able to do. Um, where the idea of also writing some of these biographies and, and program notes for a popular public um, was one way that, that women who wouldn't necessarily have access to um, sort of university um, music um, systems um, could contribute to kind of music research and intellectual life. Thanks. Thank you everybody so much. Um, it's now time for our break for coffee and cake. And that has, I believe, been set up in the lobby where you came in. So we'll go out there. I'm trying to get a final head count for who will be joining us for dinner tonight so that I can call and confirm it with the restaurant. So if you would like to join us, please come find me. I'll be up there to having cake. So thanks so much for this session. <laughs>